let's get going. And first, I need to say who I am and why I am doing this. So um, I've recently attended the WAS 2021. I'll tell you all about that. And there it's very important to always introduce your perspective from which place you're coming from when you're talking about sex. So I'm a cisgendered, married, heterosexual woman with two teenage daughters. And my background is actually coming from the sex education perspective. So I've had a huge passion for sexual health. And when I was, while I was specializing in the UK, I worked as a school doctor, both in the state sector, running something called Time for You Clinics, as well as helping a private independent school actually write a sex education curriculum. And then when we returned to South Africa in 2006, I was a, I've been a, an involved in various um, school doctor projects. Um, in my clinical practice for many, many years, when returning in South Africa, many of you will know me from the HIV and TV platforms, and I've always had a special interest in adolescent health and youth-friendly facilities. And currently, I'm now working as a family physician at Walter Sisulu University, uh, based at CMH Hospital, a large regional hospital here in Mtatsani in, in near East London. Um, Eastern Cape, and I also am on the portfolio for the Rural Doctors Association, very passionate about mentoring and teaching. So this is all fitting into my remit as a, as a family physician. Also have a small disclaimer, always important when we talk about sex, because sex is very sensitive as an issue, and one does not want to offend. So if I do say the wrong thing or um, just, just don't get it quite right, please feel free to correct me in the chat. I am also still learning. So I'm just a small little doctor standing on the shoulders of some very large giants. And the thing that's inspired um, ourselves to actually put this presentation together is some very exciting things that's been happening in the world of sexual health. So the first big thing is the World Association for Sexual Health had its 25th Congress for the first time in Africa. Um, and this one was based in Cape Town. So we hosted it in the 9th to 12th of September. I was very fortunate to um, be provided with a free entrance to the conference and are still watching some of the virtual virtual presentations. There was literally hundreds of presentations. Um, and was 2021, their, their theme was leave no one behind. And in Africa, this is a, a very relevant, relevant um, in terms of sexual health. Then I'll also be talking quite a lot about the Global Advisory Board um, of Sexual Health and Wellbeing, which is a global international organization, very much endorsed by WAS um, in terms of supporting sexual health in the world. And then the WHO has also been doing um, very much work in updating their understandings around sexual health, specifically, um, for example, in their revising of the ICD-11, and we'll, we'll also talk about that. So the Global Advisory Board already um, a few years ago now has very much created this, what they call the tripartite elements um, around sexuality and sexual health that um, helps us to look at how we plan sexual health programs. And they have these three important elements. So they are sexual pleasure, sexual rights, and sexual health. Um, and if you think in terms of all of these three things are absolutely essential if you want to be able to actually provide um, a proper perspective on what's happening around sex and sexual health in, in, in your programs and also on a, on a personal level. So when we talk about sexual pleasure, this is obviously our end user. And the idea of course is that we're having sex hopefully for pleasure. I mean, occasionally you might have sex because you want to have a baby, but ideally the driving force for sex should be sexual pleasure. Um, but what's interesting is that sexual pleasure is often left out of the conversation when we are um, discussing, for example, condom use or um, a lot of other sexual health prevention and health interventions that we have. Um, and a lot of emphasis in the last decade, and we'll talk a little bit about that, is about understanding how to talk through sexual pleasure when we're also advising our patients. A little bit, so sexual pleasure on the agenda the last 10 years in terms of programs. In the last 100 years, obviously, sexual rights has become um, something that has arisen. It's relatively recent. 200 years ago, there was no such thing as sexual rights. There was only what was allowed and what was not allowed. Um, and sexual rights is interesting because as, depending on your politics, your society, your culture, your religion, you will look at sexual pleasure and there, these different perspectives will define what is allowed and what is not allowed. Um, and this um, has created over the years, many inequalities in different countries in terms of what different countries would allow 
as, as a sexual right and whatnot. And we're going to be looking at, at that in, in a little bit of detail as well in the second part of this presentation. Um, and of course, within that world of sexual health, which is very uh, varied across, across the world that we live in, is our medical sexual health services that's been around for, well, centuries. There's a lovely saying from about 200 years ago when we used to treat syphilis with, um, with mercury. So one night with Venus, two years with mercury. Um, and sexual health has pretty much stayed on that track. We look at STIs, we look at contraception, and we look at how to, at the physical aspects of sexual health. Um, and these three are very important in the ways that they intersect when we are creating programs and also when we're looking after our patients. So where do I place myself within this conversation? And I will declare quite clearly, I am a very much a family physician perspective. Um, and I think the challenge we find as doctors is that as doctors, we have our places in our society. So we might come from a certain cultural background, from a certain religious background, certain political affiliations, certain organizations or ideologies that we believe in, um, and that we also have our role as a doctor with a patient sitting in front of us. And sometimes those two can be at odds. So how am I relating this triangle of sexual pleasure, sexual rights, and sexual health to my role as the doctor? And I'm a family physician, so we're going to talk very much about patient-centered care today, where we're not going to look so much at the doctor's agenda, but we're going to look a little bit about our patient. And the three aspects that we want to look at is we want to be able to understand what my patient's concept is of sexual pleasure. We obviously uh, want to respect our patient sexual rights. We've great at that in South Africa. I'm going to show you some excellent slides on that and this extraordinary ability that we have for tolerance and embracing each other in this country. And then, of course, important, we need to provide relevant evidence-based sexual health services. So what I'm going to do in my presentation is I'm going to go through each of these in quite a bit of detail, which means we'll go a little bit beyond um, six o'clock. For those of you that have joined more recently, just to let you know, at six o'clock, there will be a survey going out for those of you who want ethics CPD points, which it looks like we might be getting. There might be two ethics CPD points for the session. So do, do stay with us. Um, but each of the sections will also be separately recorded and will be separately available. So part one that I want to look at is specifically around sexual pleasure. And I want to mention here the Pleasure Project. Um, they did amazing presentations that was 2021 there. You can see their slogan there, putting the sexy into safer sex. They very much look at sexual health programs. So that is their focus and how to use pleasure and the way we discuss and talk about pleasure to actually create better um, consultations with our patients when we're trying to talk about sexual health um, and sexual um, prevention, for example. So they have something actually called the pleasure meter which sounds very kinky, but it isn't. Um, and what it does is it's literally a survey, a completely anonymous survey that you take online to, to check your own particular program and how much, how friendly it is in terms of your population when you think from the, from the pleasure, pleasure lens and pleasure perspective. And very well worth looking up if you're actually in a scenario where you're providing sexual health services. So there's... Um, it's interestingly, there's definitions of sexual health and sexual rights. The definition of sexual pleasure is a working definition because it is amazing how controversial it is to actually pin this down. But I want to highlight the middle bit of this definition. So quite often people get nervous around sexual pleasure because it feels that there's potential risk or danger in that. And very important, um, this is the working definition from Gab, there's a few principles that must be present for sexual pleasure to be present. Um, and I want to highlight those as self-determination, consent, safety, privacy, confidence, and the ability to communicate and negotiate sexual relations. So these are key enabling factors. And you can see how already sexual pleasure and sexual rights have um, are, way, are combining in, in so many different ways. Um, and very important, when I talk about sexual pleasure today, I'm always talking in terms of consenting adults, um, if one can put it that simply. 
So I can't cover the whole area of sexual pleasure, but I do want to get into some of the nitty gritty bits of it. Um, and want to just, uh, I think, hopefully most of us are aware of this, but it's good to actually challenge this outright, that there are very particular sexual myths that are being promulgated. Uh, probably we could just blame Hollywood and particularly blame Grey's Anatomy. So good sex is supposed to be spontaneous, should always end in an amazing orgasm. It's simply much the same as intercourse and always requires an erection for things to work. So. This is not just from Hollywood that we have this particular perspective on what sexual pleasure is. Uh, we can also um, blame these two lovely doctors in the top here, that is William Masters and Vivian Johnson. Um, and they did the first big um, lab studies on sex in 1966. Their work was groundbreaking and has been enormously helpful, but there has also been limitations. And they created this sexual um, response cycle which has been updated by Kaplan so this is the one you normally get taught in medical school and pretty much it's got this nice very particular linear function so that's sexual tension on uh, y-axis time on this side you start with desire you get a rose things get better and hotter then you have your great orgasm and then it all resolves afterwards and everybody falls asleep and pretty much that's the way sex works so it's very important to realize that when they did the study, they actually got couples to come in to their laboratory and they um, did all kinds of wonderful observations and monitoring and uh, physiological checking. I don't know all the details of how they did that, but this was actually studying sex by observing it. But of course, there was a bias in terms of who they studied. Um, and the people who came in were heterosexual. They were married couples. They were obviously cisgendered. And very interestingly, one of the requirements to get enrolled on the study is that the woman had to be able to have orgasm during vaginal sex. So I'm hoping there's a few rolled eyes in the, in the audience, um, because as you, as you well know, there's actually quite a small percentage of women that are able to achieve orgasm during vaginal sex. So they created, a, they took a very, very specific sample out of society, uh, never mind the fact that we're sitting obviously in Europe. Um, and out of that, they created the standard model of sex. And when anybody had to measure what was considered, um, you know, sex that had to be fixed, then it was anything that fell outside of this model. Um, and this is, of course, again, the same thing that's been perpetuated through, um, through media and through articles and through um, even things like our DSM-4, which is changing and moving on. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about that just now. So the fly in the ointment, of course, of this was, is that this is traditional sexual response cycle excludes a diverse range of experiences. So there's lots of people who do not fit into this particularly nice, um, easy, simple category. And a lot of new concepts have been added and has been modifying this traditional model of sexual desire and pleasure. And when you go out um, into the research, you find that it's actually a very messy field in terms of terminology, in terms of how things get measured, in terms of what we consider to be our benchmark to decide whether something is a disorder. Um, and there's actually still a lot of, we do not have a nice, clear science around sexual pleasure and sexual desire specifically. So I'm going to pick out some of the stuff that is challenging this traditional model and some of the terms that's coming up. So some of the terminology we're going to look at today is um, the words eroticism versus nurturance. So these are some of the, the concepts you will find if you look in the, in the sexual world literature. And if you look in the normal sexual health, um, especially around arousal disorders, etc., you will find these terminologies spontaneous versus responsive desire. So what do I mean? by these particular concepts. So what I want to do is I want to just expand a little bit our understanding of what I am calling intimate bodily pleasure for lack of a better word. And what has happened in, because we've had this like little um, sex cycle that's been put as this is sex, there's been, it's been taken out of context out of intimate bodily pleasure within a relationship. Um, and intimate bodily pleasure does include definitely sexual pleasure, but it also includes a large section of something that I'm calling sensual pleasure. That's my own specific terminology. Um, and I use this terminology when I explain sexual pleasure to teenagers. So this is my perspective. So apologies if I talk down a little bit. And what's important with both of these is both of these I'm defining as powerful bodily attractions to an intimate partner, and it includes touch or a need or a want to be touched. So this is not just, you know, the, 
the romantic side on its own. It has to do specifically with bodily pleasure. So what happens under the covers when the clothes come off. And what's interesting is that when you look in the, in the literature, although they have different ways in how they describe it, it's quite clear that there are different ways in which people explore and enjoy bodily pleasure. So some people, it's all about sexual pleasure. And for some people, sensual pleasure actually is much more important. We all want a mix of the two. And it might be different at different times of our lives and with different people and in different situations. So there's a whole mixture of how we mix these two up. For simplicity's sake, I'm going to divide them up and describe them separately first. But please remember, they do, they do mix. It's like a good cocktail. So first, let's talk about sexual pleasure. So this is the good old-fashioned Masters and um, Johnson and Kaplan model that we saw first. And this is very much a linear story, right? So it starts off with sexual desire or sexual arousal or lust or sexual urge or you're horny or whatever term you want to use for it. Then it goes through a whole phase of sexual pleasure. And the whole goal of the sexual pleasure is to get to orgasm. So when we talk about sexual pleasure in this context, we're being very specific. So we're focusing towards orgasm, it's goal orientated, it's genital fo focused, and it ends with ejaculation. So after ejaculation, the whole thing has, is, is done. Um, and when you look at descriptions of male and female sexual desire in terms of this cycle, it's not very different. So men, it tends to present and start off with an erection. There's increased blood flow to the genital areas, which makes those areas more sensitive and wanting to be touched. There's increased muscle tension. There's increased heart rate. The skin flushes. For women, it's very similar, but apparently the clitoris also swells. Um, but what's interesting with women is that women do not always have the same experience in their bodies of, um, for example, things like vaginal wetness is always said to be related to sexual desire. And apparently there's, there is incongruence there. So it's not always as simple. But if you were to physically measure um, the, the physiological response in both the male and the female body, when they have this, um, what we are defining as sexual pleasure, there's very similar physiological changes that happens. And the framework or the word we're going to use for this is eroticism and anything you Google about sex on the net will get you here. So this is pretty much the sex we know. This is Gray's Anatomy um, and the very busy on call rooms. I don't think our on call rooms get quite as busy. And if you want to look at the physiological basis, it has something to do with testosterone. And I say something because this is actually not well understood. We do know that testosterone is there and present and part of the sexual um, cycle, whether it's in men or women. But for example, in women, when they try to measure testosterone levels, you can't link a woman's testosterone levels directly to her sexual desire levels. And when you try and treat with testosterone, it seems to be very erratic who responds and to what. So although testosterone is a key part of what we're physiologically experiencing when we're experiencing sexual pleasure, it doesn't mean that um, it's always it's as simple as measuring a level. It's obviously got something also to do with androgenic receptors and a whole lot of other things that play into it. And this is the kind of stuff we need more, we need more research on. So now I'm going to go to something that we don't, we, is very present in, in sexual desire and sexual and in intimate bodily pleasure, let's use that word, um, but is not so well defined, especially when we do sex education. So when our young teenagers look at Hollywood and look at what they see, all they see is sexual pleasure and not a real understanding of sensual pleasure in terms of the body specifically. So here we are more in a cycle and our cycle starts also with a word that I've specifically coined in this concept, which I'm calling sensual attraction to um, differentiate it from sexual desire. So remember sexual desire is literally being horny where sensual attraction is something completely different, but it's still a bodily response. And typically in your Hollywood setup, this is your starry eyed, the weak knees, the enraptured, giddy, swooning. There's the Titanic moment. Um, not sure what Jack is feeling, but we can assume that maybe Rose at this stage might be in a state of sensual attraction, but not necessarily horny. She might be, but she might not be. So sensual pleasure has got a very different nature than sexual pleasure. In sensual pleasure, it's more expansive. It's actually euphoric, makes you happy, which sexual pleasure does not necessarily do when you're busy building towards orgasm. It's relaxing, so it doesn't make the heart rate necessarily go up. 
it's very much in the moment. It's not goal orientated. It's not working towards an orgasm, for example. And there can be physical features like tingling in the body and an oversensitivity of the skin in general, um, but not necessarily in the genital organs. So the genital organs at this point is still quiet. And what's interesting with sensual pleasure is it's got a strong emotional component, which sexual pleasure doesn't have. So in good sex, you'll have both and therefore emotions are involved, but it's possible to have a pure sexual pleasure, linear experience without any, without much emotional involvement. So with emotions here, I mean feelings of intimacy, warmth, love, the ability to be vulnerable, respect, communication, affection, those kinds of things. And there is bodily pleasure involved here. I keep on emphasizing that, but this is the bit that gets confusing. So, um, there's a pleasure from sensual touching, kissing, holding, massaging, all of those things, but we're not yet in the realm of sexual desire. I'm keeping them separate at the moment. So the word that gets used for this quite often is nurturance. And there are more and more writing, especially within the sexual pleasure networks of people saying, hold on, why can I only, why do I only have to experience pleasure with my partner through orgasm I you know I, don't, I can orgasm I can take it or leave it I really want the cuddling and the 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 sensual part of it the nurturing part of it I want to be by somebody that we're nurturing each other so um, again the two overlap but some people have a very much a preference I'm more somebody who likes the orgasm part of this or I'm somebody who likes the cuddling part of this so the hormone obviously that gives us the physiological experiences that we have is oxytocin and similar to testosterone, we can definitely measure the physical effects of this and oxytocin, but measuring oxytocin its own doesn't tell us very much about being able to predict these feelings. Oxytocin is obviously just like testosterone, not only excreted in this particular scenarios, we also have it in breastfeeding, for example, it's part of the letdown reflex, but also creates feelings of bonding towards a small baby. And whenever we're nurturing or whenever anybody nurtures us, oxytocin comes into play. And it has this very special experience then when one's in a scenario of being within with an intimate partner. And because it doesn't build to necessarily a climax, it's something that creates a cycle. So you're attracted to somebody, you cuddle and chat and talk and all of those things, which leads to increased intimacy and increased attraction. So there's a very much a cyclical um, aspect to this kind of pleasure, which is different from sexual pleasure. Great. Now let's look at some examples. Oh, hold on. Before we get to examples, let me talk about the other axes. So the reason why I've talked about, I'm talking about spontaneous and responsive sexual desire second um, is because there's still a lot of confusion in our terminology with, with these two concepts. So these two concepts came out as a response to that very first um, Kaplan cycle. And the person who actually updated the cycle is a lady called Rosemary Besson. And there is issues with the cycle. My biggest issue here, she calls it the female sexual response cycle, where um, of course, all of these cycles we are seeing can happen across both sexes. But in this um, particular cycle, she started bringing in the fact that it could be a cycle and that emotionally intimacy could be part of that cycle. And she used the word receptive. And then the person who's really put these terms on the map here is Emily uh, Nagasaki, Nagaski, uh, who raised an amazing book called Come As You Are. She's in sexual education, did a PhD in that, um, and really started creating these terms, spontaneous and responsive desire. So in a lot of research, when you look now, or in a lot of um, sex education materials, they have these two different concepts. So what do we mean by that? So with spontaneous desire, this would be our normal, um, uh, normal, should not use the word normal. This should be the standard um, old model from, from Kaplan and then, and the, the assumption was that what people have a innate sexual desire that quite often during the week might present in them having sexual desire arising um, with minimal stimuli in the environment. They might have regular sexual fantasies and they might have masturbation um, and they might have a desire to have sex and orgasm. So that's spontaneous sexual desire. And in terms of our prevalence of that versus responsive sexual desire, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, we don't know because there was just an assumption that spontaneous sexual desire is what you're supposed to have. And then all these other criteria was measured against that. 
So we actually don't have very much data in terms of if we were to look at the population. So how many people have spontaneous sexual desire? So often have sexual desire that arises spontaneously. And how many people only have responsive sexual desire? So with responsive, I mean that they do not have sexual desire that arises spontaneously necessarily at all. Not much sexual fantasies, not necessarily masturbating, um, but in intimate scenarios, and usually with quite a bit of sensual pleasure as a start off point, um, it can go into sexual desire. And then once sexual desire starts, it's exactly the same as the, the sexual desire we spoke about earlier, exactly the same cycle. So responsive sexual desire recognizes that some people just don't have an automatic um, sexual desire, spontaneous sexual desire that constantly lies under the surface. So just to illustrate on some of the data we have, on limited data we have. So spontaneous sexual desire, some of the only, well, the only really good data I could find of a population that has a lot of spontaneous sexual desire was heterosexual cisgender teenage boys. And it's only because we have numbers on them. So we obviously, there might be large other populations like this. And you can notice that it's 85 to 94% of teenage boys will, during that time, experience heterosexual, um, experience spontaneous sexual desire, whether it is hetero or, or same sex. Oh, I see my connection is unstable. Caressa, just interrupt me if I do suddenly go offline. So with spontaneous desire, these boys will experience erections, not necessarily always for very explicit, but even for minimal stimuli. Uh, they might wake up with erections, they might have emissions at night, um, they might have sexual fantasies, and they might have a desire to have sex. And this is a completely acceptable phenomenon. And of course, this has been used to then measure quite often how, um, for example, our girls is supposed to behave. So one of the challenges with teenage girls is we know the teenage girls, these numbers are lower. And then quite often it's been blamed on suppressed girls. They um, obviously their sexuality is suppressed or they not, you know, get out the hand mirrors and get in touch with their own bodies. But there is more and more of an understanding now that maybe there's a different type of sexual desire called responsive sexual desire working through a different physiological framework. The only data we have on this is studies done usually on, again, cisgender heterosexual women. Um, and there's a few studies on women in long-term relationships. And in the studies, it was called low sexual desire. So they were measuring against our spontaneous sexual desire. Well, they didn't use the word spontaneous. They were looking at this is what you're supposed to have. And then if women did not have sexual fantasies, was not masturbating, and they initiated sex, they were classified as low sexual desire. And then in these studies, they found, oh, look, 70% or 80% or in one study, 90% of postmenopausal women have low sexual desire. And you can see I have issues with the word because it made an assumption that there was a deficit in terms of desire. But of course, if 70 or 80% of your population is experiencing something, maybe the problem is not that it's low, maybe it's just that it's different. And so these words now, a lot of these studies have been looking at, when you look at them retrospectively, you can think, well, a lot of that looks like it's probably responsive sexual desire. And what one needs to look at is what kind of environment do these women need for responsive desire to, to become um, active sexual desire or active sex. Um, and again, this is very also again, narrow definition. And the problem with this definition, again, is it's only looking at sexual desire. It's you're either horny or you're not. Um, and it misses out this whole in-between bit of what I'm calling sensual desire. So this also is one of my um, frameworks that I use when I talk to teenagers or when I talk to my own daughters about sex and sexual pleasure in terms of being able to understand how sexual pleasure may or may not work. This is not the only frameworks one can use to talk about sexual pleasure. And it's more for me to illustrate a little bit about what I'm going to call sexual diversity. So the blue dots is all different possible people. I have no idea how they clustered because we don't know. We don't even have good data from Europe, although we have a little bit of data. We have no data in South Africa, and I certainly have not any data in the Eastern Cape in terms of this kind of diversity. So our top access there, the question we can ask 
is how do you experience sexual desire? So is it, or do you experience spontaneous desires? So having erections or gentle awakening or sexual fantasies or a desire for sex um, more than once a week kind of a thing, depending on how you want to set your DSM definition. And then on the other side, do you, are you somebody that has more responsive desires? So you might not ever have a spontaneous arising of sexual de desire, but after a good cuddle on the couch and getting under the covers, sexual desire easily arises as a response to intimate, um, intimate stimuli. And of course, there's a whole spectrum. And of course, the spectrum can change over time and can change in different relationships. Um, and there's no, there's no right or wrong way to be on the spectrum. And if you look on the other side, I'm talking about specifically this physical bodily pleasure. So how do you experience bodily or physical pleasure? And is the most important thing for you in sex orgasm? So is it all about um, the eroticism, the sexual pleasure, you know, getting towards ejaculation? Um, or is it more on this um, aspect of nurturance, of sensual pleasure of cuddling of kissing of 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 that side of of the spectrum and again there's a spectrum and of course most people prepare you know prefer a mix and then people have a, might have a bit of a more of a preference depending on the relationship their age a whole lot of things might affect that so what happens is is on this board now you have a whole lot of bunch of different people that might have different um access is where they're sitting at this particular moment of time. And of course it can change. And of course the challenge we have is when you look at Gray's anatomy or when you look at the old Kaplan um, cycle, we're assuming everybody's sitting in this top left-hand corner and everybody else that's not sitting in the top, top left-hand corner. Uh, we have discussions, Cosmopolitan, various videos, self-help books, trying to get all of these people to having spontaneous desire and great orgasms. So one of the first things being able to recognize is this, this diversity. So now I'm gonna do a slight, very stereotypical um, example of the misunderstandings created by this kind of scenarios around sexual pleasure. And apologize that we start off with very straightforward, but this kind of thing I've come across a lot, both in the UK and South Africa. Uh, we've got two teenagers, we'll make them 18 years old, just to make it simple. And it's my trick and it's after party, end of the year, um, and they're on the couch and the things are going great. Um, and I'm gonna make them very boring at the moment, heterosexual, cisgender, 18 year old couple. And let's make an assumption, right? For these two particular people, because obviously it will vary, our boy here is a high level, he's got a high level of spontaneous desire, he's in the top left-hand corner there, and he experiences his pleasure mostly through eroticism, right? All about the orgasm, and when he fantasizes, that's where it all goes. Our girl, we're going to put in the very right bottom corner there, um, and she's got a high level of responsive desire. So, and she experiences a high level of pleasure through sensual pleasure, through nurturance. So she gets lots of crushes on boys. She um, has, um, has that starry eyed swooning. Oh my, oh, he's so great. You all know the teenage girls scream. Um, you know, you, when, you want, when you want to see this in, in high action, you can see them in the front row of like, you know, a Beatles concert, or Justin Bieber, whoever's the newest great thing at the moment. Um, and in that scenario, what is important to understand is that they are experiencing very powerfully bodily changes and bodily experience of being physically highly attracted to, um, to whoever they are with, whether it is opposite sex or same sex. So in this scenario, the two are on the couch. And one of the challenges we have is that quite often, um, a lot of our teenage girls, hopefully it's better now with all the social media out there, or it might be worth it. <laughs> have a very strong experience of being um, very much um, in the, oh, I'm saying somebody just please mute yourself when Thank you come you. in, just very much. Thanks, Garessa.
There we go. Thank you very much. So for, I assume somebody's just joined. Don't worry, we're talking about sex. Um, so on the left hand, we've got our boy here who's got predominantly sexual desire. At this moment in time, he's very much attracted to her. And she's very attracted sensually, but she does not know the word and she does not understand the description. So the problem is this girl in this particular scenario has never masturbated. When she has fantasies, she has extensive fantasies and it all ends in the kiss. Nothing beyond that. Um, and all this, but she has seen Grey's Anatomy and she knows that she's supposed to be having sex. Um, and so at one stage, they're having a passionate snog on the couch. They're both very attracted to each other, but they're experiencing it in different ways. The boy's hands start to in sex. It's all about Mr. Taylor. Dr. Taylor, can you just mute, please? Excellent, thank you. So we have our very, you know, uh, essential moment to get interrupted. So our two um, kids on the couch is having this extraordinary experience of attraction, but the girl is not at that moment horny and she doesn't know she's horny in this particular example. So the problem is, is that when you have sexual desire, the gentle organs become very sensitive and become very keen to touch. So that's why the boy's on the way to the, to the you know, to where he wants to be touched. But the girl suddenly has an experience as he makes his way towards the genitals that she doesn't like it. She doesn't know why she doesn't like it. The only reason why she doesn't like it is because she's not horny yet. It will come once her desire kicks in. But she doesn't know the concept and she doesn't know the term. And so there's a couple of scenarios, possible scenarios I want to highlight. The one scenario is, is that she pushes the hand away. Doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel comfortable. She's very attracted to the guy, but somehow something has just gone wrong and she doesn't understand why. And now you can imagine the amount of misunderstanding happening in this moment. He's like, well, I thought you were keen and she thinks she's supposed to be keen. So maybe there's something wrong with her. Um, and you have a whole set of misunderstandings around that. The other scenario, which I found I find heartbreaking is girls who feel, now we're going to have sex. That's what I thought I was going to do. I'm feeling very hot and flustered and attracted. I must be horny. Um, and they go through with the sex and they have very disappointing first sex experiences and either feel that there's something wrong with them or the guy feels there's something wrong with him. Um, and in some cases, even feeling violated by what's happened and they don't understand what's going on. So the challenge with this is that there's all, of course, I'm just giving one extreme example, but you can get a lot of what I would call soap talk, all the stuff that comes up in all these teenage rom-com soaps has to do with a lot of this misunderstanding or misclassification of all these different types of sexual desire. So I call it sexual translation. And so when we talk to the teenagers, we talk a little bit about how we understand these different things. So men only want one thing. It's obviously talking about um, our guys who have spontaneous desire and loves orgasms and that in itself gets shamed, that gets seen as being inappropriate, um, where actually it's a, it's a, it's a, I'm not, I'm not going to use the word normal, it is within the, the, the standard frame of reference. The other side is, of course, none of this, although um, we've got a lot of teenage girls and we don't know the numbers that we think sits in this bottom corner, we definitely have at least 20 to 30 percent of girls who also, like the boys, have spontaneous desire and likes orgasms. Um, but if they have similar sexual behavior to the boys, we have all the whole phenomenon around slut shaming. Girls who do then start bringing in their boundaries when they're feeling uncomfortable or not ready, get terms like cock teaser or being frigid. There's a lot of weird negotiations happening both ways about people thinking that if the other one suddenly doesn't like them or if you like me, then you should be horny or you should be um, not pushing me or all the confusion around that. And then vast amounts of inadequacy issues, which is what we normally do with the guys either being unhappy because for some reason the girl is unhappy or the girl wondering that she's not right or he's not right or and there's just general confusion. And now to make this a lot worse, let's add in some sexual diversity. So I've just given one framework of sexual pleasure, but of course within there, our sexual pleasure is not only affected by our desire and our experience of sexual pleasure, that's the two axes we looked at, it's also affected by our age. So a 17 year old boy, we might've been different when we were 17 and now I'm 55 or 75 and I've had a chemical castration for my prostate cancer and suddenly um, everything for me is about this bottom right-hand corner, no more, more about the top left-hand corner. Um, the life phase we're in, 
things change when you have small children, for example, our life circumstances that we might be in, the relationship we have might affect where we're at with our, our sexual pleasure. And of course, our sexual orientation, who are we attracted to, um, same sex or opposite sex, or, and of course, our gender identities, who am I when I'm having sex? And of course, from a, sex, from a doctor's point of view, all of this then gets affected by the medical conditions and the mental health conditions that our patients are presenting with, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so my biggest important message in terms of sexual pleasure is suddenly having an understanding that when your patient walks through the door, they, it's extraordinarily individual on how they experience their own sexuality. And there's an extremely large framework with when it's all of that fits absolutely perfectly. And all we really need to do for great sex, there we go, it's my great sex message, is of always being able to communicate what it is that we like and being able to communicate that with our partners and find the, those, those middle grounds or ways to, to actually enjoy pleasure together. Um, so in our terms of our programs, um, I would really love you to go and see the Pleasure Project. They've just look at their website, they've just released um, seven principles in terms of sexual health programs. And you can also apply it in terms of your own sexual health relationships. And I just wanna emphasize this core value here, which is being positive when we talk about sex. Um, and quite often a lot of our messaging, especially when we talk to young people are so negative. Um, and from an evidence point of view, being positive in terms of sexual messaging is gonna get our teenagers more compliant. So for later sexual debut, for better condom use, for um, prevention of teenage pregnancy, all of those things they have shown that positive sexual discussions, so talking sexy, um, actually has a much better way of actually engaging and changing behavior than all of our fear-based methodologies that is what's been so popular in the last couple of decades of sex, sex education. <laughs> 